Hello everyone, my name is Iman. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today we're going to be covering chapter 10 for our MCAT general chemistry playlist. This chapter is titled Acids and Bases and we're going to cover the following objectives. The first objective is titled Definitions. So we're going to begin by defining Arrhenius, bronsted lori and Lewis acids and bases. In addition, we're going to explore amphoteric species and we're going to cover the essential terminology for acid-base nomenclature. The second objective is titled Properties. Here we're going to dive into the properties of acids and bases, starting with the autoionization of water and hydrogen ion equilibria. Our discussion will then move to strong and weak acids and bases, conjugate acid-base pairs, the concepts of Ka and Kb, and finally, salt formation. Then we'll move into our third objective. Here, we're going to examine the concepts of polyvalence and normality and understand how they apply to acids and bases. Finally, our last objective is titled titration and buffers. We're going to study titrations involving strong acid, strong base, weak acid, strong base, strong acid, weak base, and weak acid, weak base interactions. We'll also explore titrations involving polyvalent acids and bases. And then this chapter will conclude with an in-depth look at buffers and the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. With this introduction, Let's go ahead and get started with the first objective. Over the past century, chemists have developed three definitions to classify compounds as acids or as bases, and each subsequent definition has become more inclusive than the previous one. We're going to start with the Arrhenius definition. An Arrhenius acid is a compound that, when added to water, dissociates to produce hydrogen ions. Now, these hydrogen ions often are associated with water molecules to form hydronium ions, H3O+. Now, here we see the general equation for an Arrhenius acid. HA represents the Arrhenius acid, which dissociates in water to yield hydronium ions and A-, where A- is the conjugate base of the acid. Now, this process increases the concentration of hydrogen ions in the solution. What about an Arrhenius base? An Arrhenius base is a compound that, when dissolved in water, dissociates to produce hydroxide ions. Now here we can see the general equation for an Arrhenius base. B represents the Arrhenius base, which dissociates in water to yield hydroxide ions and HB+, where HB+, is the conjugate acid of the base. This process increases the concentration of hydroxide ions in the solution. Now, Arrhenius acids and bases are really easily identified. Acids contain hydrogen at the beginning of their formula, and bases contain OH at the end of their formula. Now, any mention of the Arrhenius definition on the MCAT will likely be in comparison to other definitions of acids and bases. The Arrhenius definition is by far the most restrictive, so the bronsted lori and the Lewis definitions really predominate on the MCAT. With that being said, let's discuss the bronsted lori definition of acids and bases. This definition really expands upon the limitations of the Arrhenius concept, and it provides a more versatile framework for understanding acid-base chemistry. Now here, a bronsted lori acid is a species that donates a proton, a H+, so a hydrogen ion, while a bronsted lori base is a species that accepts a proton. Now this definition is broader than the Arrhenius definition. Here we can see the general equation for a bronsted lori acid. HA donates a proton to water, 
forming the hydronium ion and the conjugate base. And here we see the general equation of a bronsted lowry base. B accepts a proton from water, forming hydroxide ions and the conjugate acid. Now, the bronsted lowry definition, it has several advantages. First, it's not limited to aqueous solutions. So, for example, ammonia, NH3, and fluoride ion are both bronsted lowry bases because they can accept a proton even though they do not produce hydroxide ions in aqueous solutions. Second, it includes more chemical species. So for instance, water can act as both a bronsted lowry acid by donating a proton and a bronsted lowry base by accepting a proton. And this all depends on the reaction context. Now, according to the bronsted lowry definition, acids and bases always occur in pairs. So when an acid donates a proton, it becomes its conjugate base. On the other hand, when a base accepts a proton, it becomes its conjugate acid. Now this relationship is really important to understanding acid-base reactions, and we're gonna further elaborate on it in the second objective. But here we also wanna take a look at a quick example. Let's look at this reaction right here. In this auto-ionization of water, one water molecule acts as a bronsted lowry acid and donates a proton, and the other acts as a bronsted lowry base and accepts a proton. And what happens is we form hydronium ions and hydroxide ions. Now here, this water molecule that is acting as an acid and our hydroxide ions, these are a conjugate acid base pair. So is the water that acts as a base and are hydronium ions. They are also a conjugate acid base pair. Now last, let's explore the Lewis definition of acids and bases. Now a Lewis acid is defined as an electron pair acceptor, while a Lewis base is defined as an electron pair donor, like we see in these reactions written here. Now, this definition was, was proposed by Gilbert Lewis around the same time as the bronsted lowry concept, and it really broadens the scope of acid-base chemistry to include a variety of chemical reactions that go beyond hydrogen ion transfer. Now, the key difference between the Lewis and the bronsted lowry definitions lies in their focus. The bronsted lowry definition focuses on the transfer of protons, while the Lewis definition focuses on the transfer of electron pairs. Now, although these definitions may appear different, they really describe similar behaviors in acid-base reactions. So for example, in a bronsted lowry reaction, the acid donates a proton and the base accepts it. In a Lewis reaction, the base donates an electron pair to the acid. Now on the MCAT, you may encounter Lewis acids in the context of organic chemistry reactions because Lewis acids are often used as catalysts. Now to kind of tie in all these concepts together, the Lewis definition, remember, is the most inclusive of the three. Now that means something very important. Every Arrhenius acid is also a bronsted lowry acid. And every bronsted lowry acid is also a Lewis acid. Similarly, every Arrhenius base is also a bronsted lowry base. And every bronsted lowry base is also a Lewis base. However, this is really important. Not all Lewis acids and bases can be classified under the Arrhenius or the bronsted lowry definitions. And this inclusivity allows the Lewis definition to really cover a broader range of reactions, including those that do not involve hydrogen ions directly. Now, with that, 
Let's discuss amphoteric species. An amphoteric species is one that reacts like an acid in a basic environment and like a base in an acidic environment. Now, in the bronstant lori sense, an amphoteric species can either gain or lose a proton, making it amphiprotic as well. Now, on the MCAT, water is the most common example. Water is both an amphoteric and an amphiprotic substance, which is frequently encountered in various contexts on the MCAT. Its dual nature to act as both an acid and as a base makes it a very important molecule in acid-base chemistry. Now, when does water act like an acid? When water reacts with a base, it behaves as an acid. In a basic environment, water can donate a proton acting as a bronstant lori acid. Well, when does water act like a base? When water reacts with an acid, it behaves as a base. In an acidic environment, water can accept a proton, therefore behaving as a bronstant lori base. Now, other common examples of amphoteric species include amino acids and partially deprotonated polyprotic acids. Amino acids are particularly interesting because they contain both a carboxyl group, COOH, which can donate a proton, and an amino group, and H2, which can accept a proton. And this dual functionality is really important in biological systems. Also, partially deprotonated polyprotic acids like bicarbonate and bisulfate also exhibit amphoteric behavior. Last, certain metal oxides and hydroxides, such as aluminum hydroxide and zinc oxide, are considered amphoteric. They can react with both acids and bases, but they do not necessarily involve proton transfer, so they're not classified as amphiprotic. Now, with that, we can move into nomenclature. Understanding the naming convention for acids is really crucial in chemistry, and it's going to help us identify the composition and the characteristics of various acids. So with that, let us break down the nomenclature for different types of acids, starting off with binary acids. Binary acids are composed of hydrogen and one other element. When the parent's name, all right, when the parent anion's name ends in I-D-E, the acid name is going to start with the prefix hydro and it's going to end with ic followed by the word acid. So for example, fluoride, all right, forms hydrofluoric acid. Chloride forms hydrochloric acid. Bromide forms hydrobromic acid. These acids are formed when hydrogen ions combine with these simple anions. Okay, that's our first category. What about oxyacids? Oxyacids are acids that contain hydrogen, oxygen, and another element. These acids are derived from oxyanions, which are polyatomic ions that contain oxygen. So the nomenclature depends on the suffix of the parent oxyanion. If the parent oxyanion ends in ITE, I, this indicates fewer oxygen atoms, the acid name is going to end in OS acid. If the parent oxyanion ends in eight, ATE, this indicates more oxygen atoms, the acid name ends in ic acid. Now prefixes present in the names of the oxyanions, such as hypo or per, these are retained in the names of the acids. So let's go over some examples of oxyanions ending in ITE. So here, hypochlorite forms hypochlorous acid. Chlorite forms chlorous acid. So those that's for oxyanions ending in I-T-E. What about oxyanions ending in A-T-E? So let's take chlorate, for example. This forms chloric acid. What about perchlorate? This forms perchloric acid. Okay, so that's 
oxy anions ending in I and oxy anions ending in A. What are some other common oxy acids? Nitrite, this forms nitrous acid. Nitrate, this forms nitric acid. Carbonate, this forms carbonic acid. Sulfate forms sulfuric acid and phosphate forms phosphoric acid. Some other ones that may be common as well, just for good measure, borate forms boric acid. Chromate forms chromic acid and acetate forms acetic acid. In summary, the naming of acids is systematic and it's really based on the names of their parent anions. Remember for binary acids, use the prefix hydro and the suffix ic. And for oxy acids, use the suffixes OS and ic, depending on the number of oxygen atoms in the oxy anion. Also remember that the prefixes present in the names of oxy anions are retained in the names of the acids. With that, we've completed our first objective. We're going to end this video here. In the next video, we're going to continue with objective two. I hope this was helpful. Please let me know if you have any questions, comments, or concerns down below. Other than that, good luck, happy studying, and have a beautiful, beautiful day, future doctors.